seconds ago. My presentation just became available on the computers. We had a major technical foul up just beforehand, so we got through just in time. I would like to shout out to the tech support guys up there who have been astonishingly great to work with. <laughs> Yay! So thank you, guys. Uh, I'd also like to start out just with a big thank you to IATEFL for making this whole show happen. It's great to be a part of it every year. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the British Council because we're going out on IATEFL online now. So it's not only all of you in the room here, but my mother and father in Boulder, Colorado will be tuning in. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. <laughs> My buddy Jimmy in Oxford is watching probably, and maybe people all over the world. And this will also uh, be archived on tape, so the talk will have a life beyond this event here today. Finally, a big thank you to National Geographic Learning for, for the past few years making me uh, part of the team that is doing, in my opinion, some of the most exciting work in ELT publishing at the moment. It's a, a brilliant place to be. Here's where we're going. I'd like to start with just a simple question. I've got a picture of someone here who is doing something. It's a bit old fashioned, but what's he doing? You could say, yeah, watching TED Talks, watching TV. Anyone who ever looks at this picture says the same thing. He's watching TV. There's no ambiguity there. It's a slightly old fashioned TV. He hasn't upgraded to flat screen yet, but he's watching TV. When it comes to bringing something like this into the English language teaching classroom, TED Talks, authentic video, something like that, we tend to use video as listening material. We would tend to play a TED Talk uh, and then ask some comprehension questions about it, possibly look at some grammar, some vocabulary, but ultimately we're using it as listening material and we consider it uh, the, the skill that we most obviously work on with a TED Talk would be listening. So we could say that listening is the tip of the iceberg. I think I'm going to suggest today that there's a lot more going on below the waterline. So we have listening at the top of the iceberg, this sort of 15% of the, uh, the material that we're listening to that's above the waterline. But we know that below the waterline, there's something like 85% of the, the iceberg. So when we talk about listening, we've got audio. One thing that makes something like a TED Talk so powerful is what I'm about to share with you. We've got the audio mode of input that we use for listening, but we've also got the video mode of input. So when we're watching TV, we're actually watching and listening to TV. And the fact that we have these two different modes of information, two, we could say two completely separate modes of information going from the television to our learners' brains, that's something we can hack and we can manipulate that in ways that I would like to show you. The first, and I apologize for what's going on with the slides. We had to have a last minute changeover of computers and PowerPoint, and so I didn't intend for those slides to come out that way, but I think you'll still get the idea, but they come with an apology. The first thing that I'd like to talk about with TED Talks that are kind of below the waterline are big ideas. When we think about TED Talks, of course we think of big ideas. The tagline of TED Talks is ideas worth spreading. So what we imagine is watching Ken Robinson's talk on why, school, why schools kill creativity, and then we would have our learners listen to that and we would discuss it. We all know the expression a picture's worth a thousand words. So just looking at the video side of a TED Talk, it's motion picture, right? It must be worth 10,000 words. Video alone, is an incredibly powerful tool for exchanging ideas. And I'm about to demonstrate this. If you show a video and it has the right information in it, you can transfer big ideas to learners' brains without uttering a single word of English. It doesn't have to be a listening exercise. I'd like to show you a, uh, a talk by Elora Hardy. 
She is, uh, this is just the beginning of the talk. Alora Hardy is an architect. The name of the talk is Magical Houses Made of Bamboo. And I'm going to show the talk with no sound. And what I want you to do is put yourself in the mind of whoever your learners are. And just think about the big ideas, the information that comes from those, those images, those moving pictures into your brain, the big ideas. Here we go. What's amazing about this is that it could go into literally any classroom. If you had young learners and you're talking about the, the unit three that John mentioned in the previous talk that's always about my house, we could talk about the rooms of the house and the roof and the doors and windows. If we had a group of engineers, which is who I used to teach, we could talk about the structural properties or the strength of bamboo versus steel as a construction material. If we were teaching a general adult course or university students, you could talk about the environmental impact of your home and lifestyle. All of those big ideas are built into that. And each of you will have had language and ideas and thoughts activated just by watching those pictures. Then it's the job of the teacher who's accounting for whether they're young learners or they're engineers or they're university students. You then uh, curate the language that users, that, that your learners use in the classroom. You can guide it, you can decide. The other brilliant thing about this, I'm now going to show you the talk with the audio. So when we put the audio and the video together, especially having watched the video first, you sort of get an idea what it's about, Elora will now describe the house. And you can see it's almost made for language learning. There's some slightly sophisticated language in there, but you can hear the roof, the doors, the windows, the bed, even the bathroom is represented. So check it out. Looks like I see a cursor moving there. Okay, I think to, well, all right, we'll give him 10 seconds. Shall I advance on or are you doing it? Oh, this is a presenter's worst nightmare. And you're here in my nightmare. And I don't think I'm going to wake up. So I'll have to carry on. What happens in that talk is Elora then, you've seen the video. She goes on and says, I've, uh, when I was a small child, my mother asked me what my dream house would be. I drew this picture. And then my mother built it. And I guess I didn't realize what an amazing thing that is because I now go on and design houses. And she describes the material of bamboo and how on the one hand it's tricky to work with, but on the other hand you can do these amazing things with it. And she gives this kind of walkthrough of the house and describes the rooms. And the, the, the video and the audio match perfectly. And so we get then the follow through on the big ideas. And I'm gonna skip that video And actually, what's coming next could be even more of a nightmare for me because, uh, all right, so we've talked about how a picture's worth a thousand words. We, can, we find that that video was full of language, 
Even though we didn't hear a single word, we didn't hear a single sentence, we can see that it's bringing all kinds of language into the classroom. We can do the same thing with audio. And I would like everyone to do whatever your lucky ritual is when you're really hoping something goes well, crossing your fingers, that when I say, I'm now going to play some music, <laughs> and what I'd like you to do is think about the ideas that could go with that music, the language. You could think about naming the sounds that you hear, what instruments are being played, what's the setting, is it uh, indoors, outdoors, can you hear any people in, uh, in the audio? And with any luck, when I press this button here, <laughs> wait for it, we will hear some music. They know what they're doing. Okay, it worked, yay! So what I would like to observe about that is that you can again imagine bringing it into just about any classroom. And if you wanted to work on grammar, you could work on simple sentence structures like it's a, it's a concert, it's a trumpet, it's a bass drum, whatever. Uh, you could work on the, the uh, continuous forms. He's playing or he's, they're clapping. You can see the grammar is all there. If you wanted to raise the level, it could be modals of conjecture. It could be a concert. It might be a street performer. And then there's all the natural work that we would do with nouns. We could talk about uh, the instruments that you hear. We could also respond with, how do you feel about it? Do you like it? It makes me feel excited, or I, I don't like that kind of music. All kinds of language that you as teachers would bring into the classroom and kind of help your students uh, help emerge from your students. So I'm kind of talking about something that's slightly dogma here. But we can also bring in some critical thinking with this particular exercise. We talk a lot about critical thinking in education now because, uh, especially now, because of social media, we get all kinds of messages all day long and people telling us this, people telling us that. Critical thinking is looking at the message and saying, okay, I see what the message is, but what's the message behind the message? Who is telling me this? Why are they telling me this? Or in the language classroom, you could say, are they using certain words that are emotional? Are they trying to get me excited? Or is it factual? Is the, is the speaker using lots of cleft sentences like, what's going on here is something really amazing, which would be like a salesperson. Or are they using the passive voice, which would be what a technical English engineer kind of person would say. All of that can be critical thinking in the language classroom. But we could also use what I just showed you or played for you, the sound, to introduce the idea of critical thinking. Because fingers crossed, with any luck, here's the video that goes with that audio. Okay, that's a good sign. <laughs> it's happening again, isn't it? I think they're doing their best up there. They've probably broken a sweat now. All right, I think I'm going to just talk you through this video. This video, uh, use your imagination here, is the video that goes without audio. It's a TED talk by a guy named Tom Thumb. That's not his given name, it's his uh, nom de guerre, his art, artist name. He's a beatboxer. And in his TED talk, he walks on stage with a microphone and a recording device. And he records all of that music that you just heard live. So he starts out going -dum, boom, ba -dum, boom, ba -dum, and then he adds the bass, -dum, 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 records it all, layers it up, and then the last thing that he does is play the trumpet solo over everything he's just recorded. Why is that critical thinking? because what you heard sounded like a jazz club. It sounded like a concert. It sounded like um, 
real people playing real music, then the reveal to your learners is that no, actually it's a guy giving a TED talk, making something that sounds like a concert. Of course, that's not super deep critical thinking, but if you're trying to introduce critical thinking, especially to lower level learners, then you can say, okay, we're talking about things not always being what they seem. You come to a presentation, it's supposed to be about TED Talks, and you don't see any TED Talks. <laughs> it happens in life, right? And you just have to roll with it. <laughs> Thank you. I will add that in the more traditional way, TED Talks give us uh, many, many ways of applying critical thinking because it's all people talking, people with a message. For example, you might have someone saying, this device is going to revolutionize medicine or revolutionize healthcare. He's the CEO of the company that makes this device. Or, exact same words, this device is going to revolutionize medicine, but the speaker is a doctor who spent a 30-year career giving away healthcare in impoverished communities. Do you interpret the message differently, depending on who says it? So TED Talks give us all kinds of opportunities to do that. Yeah, they're great, big ideas, but who is this person? An academic researcher? Have they developed an app they're trying to sell? We can look at that. We can also look at the language that they use to, to make their point. So plenty of critical thinking there below the waterline. <sighs> I need to do some relaxation. No, oh, thank you so much. Okay, the last talk that you're gonna see is brilliant. <laughs> I think I might have a future in describing for the, for the sight impaired, possibly. Um, so, communication skills with the dodgy X there. The final thing I'd like to talk about that is below the waterline with TED Talks is communication skills. 36% of the world's population speak English in some way, usefully. That's David Crystal's latest figure. Of the 36% who use English routinely, about 85% are second language English users. So about 15% are people like me, people from the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, but also Nigeria, the Philippines, South Africa, lots of places, 15%. What this means is that for most of our learners, they're going to be going into a world where they will be using their English with other people who are second language English speakers. So you've got your Spanish engineer going to work in Germany, communicating in English with Polish speaking engineers. What communication skills are required in that situation? It's what I call or think of uh, as cultural and linguistic agility. The people in that situation don't necessarily even know how to be polite to one another. When you're the, the, the Spanish guy and you want to address your, your boss above you in the hierarchy, and he's German, do you use Spanish politeness, German politeness? Well, you're speaking English, maybe British politeness or American politeness or Australian politeness. And the answer is you don't know that that is not built into English. English does not carry with it automatically information, that, ki that kind of cultural information. Nor does it carry with it automatically red post boxes and double-decker buses and all that. So what's required, the communication skill that's required of that Spanish engineer working with Polish people and German people is cultural and linguistic agility, the ability to do what's necessary to communicate and also to negotiate culture. They have to figure it out among themselves how to be polite to one another. They have to figure out what their culture calls for. So it's, it's a, they have to learn to create culture. We have to warn our learners that they are going into this world. Now, of course, if you're preparing people to go live and work in the US or the UK, then of course, that's the cultural target, it's clear. But for most people speaking English now, the cultural target is internationally very mixed. I would like to show you a TED talk now <laughs> by Hatain Patel. And it's a little, if, if we do actually see it, it's a little disorienting at first. You're going to hear someone who doesn't necessarily look like a Chinese speaker speaking Chinese, and it kind of goes from there. I'll tell you a little bit more about the talk after we've watched it.
，我们可以透过学习不同的语言，让人吃不同的文化嘛。除了要学习口音和腔调以外，还有词句。Hi, I'm Hei Tan. I'm an artist, and this is Yu Yu, who is a dancer I've been working with. I have asked her to translate for me. 更重要的是，手势、特有的习惯和动作。If I may, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself and my artwork. We can use different languages to learn different cultures. I was born and raised near Manchester in England, but I'm not going to say it in English to you, as I'm trying to avoid any assumptions that might be made from my northern accent. 除了要学习口音和腔调以外，还有是去。更重要的是手势、特有的习惯和动作。The only problem with masking it with Chinese Mandarin is I can only speak this paragraph, which I have learned by heart when I was visiting in China. So all I can do is keep repeating it in different tones and hope you won't notice. 更重要的是手势、特有的习惯和动作。Okay, we got there. That's the last bit of video, so I can relax now.、Uh, it's, I strongly recommend this talk. It's about 10 minutes long. Hitain, as he said, was born near Manchester. His parents were from India originally, but they came to the UK via 20 years in Mombasa in India. He talks about his fascination with Bruce Lee, the Kung Fu star. He's also fascinated with Spider-Man. He was fascinated with, as a young man with his father's amazing big mustache, and he wanted to grow one like his father. He talks a lot about imitation. That's a big theme, that he imitated his heroes. And in communication, this is a big issue now. Are, 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 are our learners imitating me, the American English speaker who's lived in the UK for 22 years? The native speaker, is that someone you need to imitate? Or do you want to imitate Yu Yu, who was speaking English there, but she's Chinese. Well, she's giving a TED talk, and her English is not perfect, but she's doing something with it. She's communicating in English. She's using all available resources to communicate. So if you wanted to imitate me or her, I'd say strongly consider imitating her. You want to be like her. You want to be a second language English speaker who has their own voice and their own identity and their own accent rather than trying to copy my kind of halfway British, halfway American accent, which you would probably never perfectly copy anyway, because second language learners rarely ever achieve a perfect native-like accent. If you can, great, some people do, but to set that up as a goal for all of our students, well, that's a pretty high mark. So we wanna use TED Talks to say, no, look at this person. Her English is not perfect, but she's, she's killing it. She's giving a TED Talk. And that, I think, I meant to leave that slide up there. Eh, that's a bit soon. That's all I have. I started off by talking about how uh, we would use something typically, something like a TED Talk or a TED Talk primarily as listening. And it works great for that. There are some talks that make, it makes brilliant listening material. But often people have said, you know, below level B1, you can't do a TED Talk because it's too hard. But I think I've shown you that by leading with the video, especially, and if you choose your talks carefully, you choose ones where the two modes of information match, you can use certain TED Talks at lower levels, bring in great ideas, and your learners will be jazzed that they actually got to watch a TED Talk, even though they're only A2 level. We can also use TED Talks uh, after we've brought in all these big ideas, possibly leading with, with sound and pictures. Uh, they're brilliant for doing critical thinking. They, you can use that trick that I just did with, with Tom Thumb and his things are not what they seem performance, uh, which you didn't actually get to see, so please go check it out online. All of these talks are freely available at TED.com. Uh, and then I've just talked about the cultural and linguistic agility that is required in the 21st century and how we can use many TED Talks, not just Hittain's, to introduce these ideas about communication. It's no longer a bad thing if somebody throws in a word of their first language 
when they're communicating because it's something that's available. It's not a mistake in English if you choose to use a word in Spanish because you like it or that's the word you know or whatever. Anyway, all of these things are things that I would love to talk about for about an hour each. This has just been a taster session to give you an idea of what I find exciting about TED Talks. Um, if you're interested in pursuing these ideas further, I am uh, about to launch at the end of this month this course, How to Teach with TED Talks, a practical course for English teachers on TEFL Equity Academy. This course will be five modules with three lectures in each module. It's a lot more than TED Talks, actually. Every module will feature a TED Talk and what you can do with it in the classroom, but it's also, I hope, a nice amount of kind of academic background on why we do what we do with TED Talks in the classroom. If you go to that website, you can get on a mailing list. I think we're going to make the first module or part of it freely available when we launch, so you can check it out, see if you like it. There's also a contest there to, uh, you can win free access, and that's over at TEFL Equity Academy with Marek Kachowiak, if you know him. Um, webinars. NGL has a webinar series. I've given several. I think they're, they're available to view after they're given. There's a QR code there. I've given two or three that are about this sort of thing, using TED Talks in the classroom. They're useful. The In Focus blog is available online. That's a blog. I believe everyone who blogs there is a National Geographic Learning author. Uh, so again, I've blogged there about using TED Talks. They're loads of resources there, ideas. They're all about 500 words, so they don't take a long time, and they're meant to be practical. If you scan your badge, which I'm not wearing on the way out, you can also get further information from National Geographic Learning. I, the two courses I've written for National Geographic Learning are Keynote, which launched about three or four years ago. That's a young adult and adult course. TED Talk in every unit. Perspectives is upper secondary, also a TED Talk in every unit. So if you want to see what these look like, what TED Talks look like in the context of a four skills course book, there are two examples plus loads other on the stand. Um, phew, we got through that. Uh, I have been asked by Aya Tefel in the email arranging this to leave five minutes at the end of my talk for q and I think we have about two minutes after my panic there. But if anyone does have any questions or comments, I think there are microphones available around, and I might have a colleague, I'm not sure, from NGL who's helping with microphones, possibly. If anyone does have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Or, sorry, I should mention this, I'm the only Lewis Lansford in the world. If you Google me, you'll find my website. I'm on social media, LinkedIn. If you want to hook up that way and ask any questions, I'm available. So any questions or comments? And it's okay if there aren't any. Yes, over here. Sorry, Laura. Yeah, that was so brave. <laughs> oh, thank you. She said that was so brave. Well, I was dying inside. <laughs> thank you so much. I guess we'll leave it there. Thank you.